let's go, we'll go back to saying Amazon. So okay. let, let's say we have, um, and again, going back and saying, okay, I found a signal here. There's a 75% chance that this stock is gonna move higher over the next three weeks. Mm -hmm. So a couple different option strategies you could do. You could buy that out of the money call, which again is the worst strategy ever. Mm -hmm. And in that case, the stock could go up and you could still lose money. Mm -hmm. And it's important to understand that. The only way in that case, if Amazon is here and you're making a bet that's gonna go here, is that it has to explode through that level mm -hmm. for you to make money. Mm -hmm. All right, so what's a better way to make money on that? Instead of trying to buy a call, um, which is a bet that it's gonna go up, you could also, there's put options that are bets that it's gonna go down. Mm -hmm. So, and again, trying to keep this as simple as possible. If the stock's gonna go up, then those put options are the first class seats that are gonna expire worthless. Right. So what you do instead of trying to buy a call is say, okay, Amazon's at $1,700. I think it's gonna go higher. The $1,700 put is selling for $10. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna sell that. Now, if you sell that, that's called selling naked options, which you don't wanna do. Mm -hmm. So as a spread, you just cap it. Mm -hmm. So I'll sell the $1,700 put. I'll buy the $1,690 as protection. Um, so uh, we're going back to that $100,000 account analogy. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll sell that for say uh, $2.50, that's $2,500. Amazon trades sideways, goes a little higher. Um, those puts expire worthless and I keep all that money. Mm -hmm. And if for some reason it implodes, my risk is fixed. Mm -hmm. So um, when you, so I, I guess in trying to juxtapose the, the first scenario you said is the wrong way to do this versus mm -hmm. what, you know, the way that you describe it, is, there, is that the continual way that you recommend uh, doing these swing trades with options or are there other aspects to it? So the easiest thing to do is, and it does take, if, if, if somebody has never traded options before, mm -hmm. that's part of it, you know, it does take a couple of weeks to understand all this. Because I know yeah. if, if someone's listening to this now going like, yeah. you're selling? What? I, I, I totally get that. When you sell it, you have to buy it back at some point in time. Yeah. yeah. So you sell it for five bucks, you buy it back for 10 cents, right. you keep the $4.90. Right. Um, but the, it, the long story short is that to, to make consistent money in options, if you think something's going to go higher, mm -hmm sell a put credit spread. Right. If you think something's gonna go lower, sell a call credit spread. Mm -hmm. Done. It's, it's a, That's it all you just boils do. down to that. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I know a lot of this is probably counterintuitive to people at first that aren't familiar with it. It absolutely is counterintuitive. So, and, and so you're, uh, again, just to reiterate, you think that it's probably three months before you kind of bake it into your brain. So when, when you do your training, and I know that you have a, a book also, tell me the title of your book. It's called Mastering the Trade. So it was out in 2005 by McGraw-Hill, and it has since gone through a couple of a couple of updates. And and uh, was there a market for the book? I mean, we're, we're, yeah, McGraw-Hill is a big publisher, so mm -hmm. it's, it's uh, they probably said, wow, there's a lot of people who are thirsty for this knowledge. Yeah, well, it was interesting, and it kind of addressed a niche of, I mean, there's a lot of good trading books out there that are very general. You know, right. this is an uptrend, this is a downtrend, mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of good books on options trading. Mm -hmm. This is what an iron condor is, and this is what a call is. Mm -hmm. But there was never a book that said, hey, when a stock looks like this, yeah. this is the correct option strategy to apply. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what we did, or what I did with Mastering the Trade, and trying to boil it down in such a way that you know, people can understand it. Now we've had some conversations with people who literally, you know, when they're trading in the market, they're, they're doing you know, fundamental analysis, you know, trying to look at the, you know, uh, you know reviewing you know, quarterly reports and, and you know, getting a <laughs> sense of things and then basically placing their bets uh, on how they see things uh, as far as doing the fundamentals. Are, are you doing almost uh, exclusively technical analysis on these stocks or how, how do you approach it? Yeah, the fun, so here's a, so a great easy resource for people is Investors Business Daily. Mm -hmm. So Investors Business Daily, every week what they do is they update what's called the IBD50. Mm -hmm. And what this is, is out of the universe of 14,000 stocks, here's the 50 that have both the best fundamentals and the best technicals. Oh. It saves a ton of time. Yeah. I don't personally do any research like that myself mm -hmm. because they do such a good job. Right. And then what I can do is take that list of 50 stocks and then apply my technical indicators and then option strategies uh, to those. And it's a very easy way to do it because that way you know that the company you're getting into has been vetted. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, oh, what does this, you know, what does this company make and do I need to read these reports? Mm -hmm. These guys have already done all that. Right. Um, there's very strict criteria to kind of get it in there and it makes it really easy. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it does, uh, using those kinds of resources, skinny it down because, I mean, it's fast. I mean, if somebody, mm -hmm. especially if you are 
that bored professional. <laughs> you know, sure. Yeah, you know, it's like who's got time to go and do all this research? But uh, so so, and you find that that's a, a trusted resource that they're analysts. Now you said you had a, an earlier career in uh, uh, analysis, right? Yeah. So what we would do is it was it was more uh, on the retail front. Mm -hmm. So it was just kind of like you know looking at inventory levels and things at stores like Target and Home Depot, and it was great because it got to kind of let me see behind the scenes of some of these companies. Mm -hmm. But while I was doing that, something that I learned is I started learning about hedge funds where they would look at the data and they would start shorting the stock. Mm -hmm. And what would happen in that case, so if a hedge fund is you know, making an attack and shorting the stock, they, they essentially think that the stock is overvalued and is gonna go down. Mm -hmm. But a fascinating trade that we found is that there are sometimes, oftentimes, when a hedge fund will do that and they're wrong. Right. So we also look for stocks that have sh um, high short interest over 20%, which mm -hmm. means that you know, if there's a million shares on float, 200,000 of them are being held short. Mm -hmm. Well, at some point, those have to be covered. Right. So we look for stocks with a 20% that are 20% short that are near within 10% of new 52-week highs. Oh, wow. So what this does is it creates a short squeeze. Mm -hmm. This is why a couple of weeks ago, Tesla went from 300 to 370 in the you know, course of a week because all the shorts got crushed. Um, those are situations where we get very aggressive, mm. and um, they're fantastic when they set up. So, to demystify for people that you know, don't, you know, they hear a term like hedge fund. So, what's a hedge fund? So, a hedge fund is so. There's, I mean, there's all kinds of different hedge funds. Uh, it's kind of a misnomer because you think, oh, this is a fund that's going to, you know, hedge all their bets, and it's not. They're just aggressive traders right. with a lot of money. Right. Um, but generally what they're doing is making much bigger bets that could last longer. Mm -hmm. So where I'm talking about, hey, I'm going to sell these puts on Amazon and try to make my 2.5% that week, they are, you know, they're looking for situations where, because it takes them weeks and months to get in and weeks and months to get out for a lot of these things. Uh, just it's, think of it as instead of you know, yourself sitting behind a computer okay. trading your account, it's a team of a thousand people looking at tons of different angles, and they've got computer algorithms feeding them all the stuff. Right. We can never compete with that, right. and so we, yeah, you don't, and you don't want to compete with. That. But they're basically the Titanic, and you're a speedboat. You know, yeah, absolutely. So, so they're essentially the yeah, it, it, they're the Titanic coming by, and we're on the surfboards trying to catch the waves. Yeah, you know, <laughs> what that creates. Interesting, and to, and you know the difference also is they they've got a, a raised fund of you know that where people invest in them, mm -hmm. as compared to most of the people doing what you do are trading their own money. I'm assuming. Absolutely, yeah. and and it's different when you're trading other people's money. There is you know you have to be more careful. Mm -hmm. um, anybody that says oh I'm fine with risk, they're lying. Mm -hmm. As soon as they see a down month, you know they're going to freak out. Right. <laughs> so as a trader, I actually prefer, and we've done both where it's like hey let's try some managed accounts and let's do this. And when you're trading your own funds, there's it goes back to that freedom. Yeah. I do it for the freedom, yeah. and so it's tougher when it's you know if you got a, a bunch of people going like, oh my gosh, this was down you know four percent this month. It's like yeah, well it was up twenty seven percent. You know whatever. It, it's yeah. just kind of a you're dealing with stuff that's like this isn't the freedom part. And yeah. So I'm a big advocate of just trading your own funds. Yeah. So and and it, you know, I think you started with some of the considerations there. So again, you know I've got a hundred thousand dollars saved, or I got you know a half million dollars saved, or whatever it might be. And now I have an option. I could either try to learn to trade this on my own, or I can hand it to a hedge fund or you know something like that and say, okay, let them go trade it. Now in their case, they've got you know fees and management fees and other things built in. So what are the considerations, one versus the other? You know, that's a, it's a really good question, and it's and it's tough because I, so my my opinion on that is that. With hedge funds and things like that, you especially if it does not have a, a long track record. Mm -hmm. So if you're, you know, you're at a cocktail party and some guy said, "Hey, I'm launching this fund," do not give them a dime. Okay, is my general rule of thumb. <laughs> um, it just that it's it's just it it just seems like I hear every story I hear like that. It just never works out. So whatever for whatever the reason. Now, if something that has a more you know a longer track record and things like that, but the thing I found that generally works the most for those kind of investments are more real estate based. Mm -hmm. So it's just more predictable. Right. Um, so that's just and again, it's just I'm thinking of someone that's like, hey, I'm a dentist. I've got five hundred thousand dollars. Am I going to put it in a hedge fund? I would say take a hundred thousand dollars and trade it yourself, and maybe put four hundred thousand dollars you know into some type of real estate investment. Mm -hmm. It's going to be more conservative, more predictable. Um, hedge funds just. You know, there's just a lot of strange things that can happen in hedge funds, and you get feed to death too. Yeah, and since you you seem to have a, a disposition to manage risk, 
um, and I know maybe this isn't your area, but uh, in your opinion, what type of real estate do you think is good investments for somebody that is that professional that's got some extra cash? Sure, and I so and I like doing real estate, um, and we'll you know just just whether it's you know hey let's buy a couple of houses and rent them out, mm -hmm. let's do you know buy you know we've. Uh, bought like a country property we'll put on Airbnb when we're not there or uh -huh. put in, in different investments uh, but things like um, the most consistent things I found are you know you find professionals that know can go in and buy like say a dilapidated apartment building and they're gonna fix it up and all that kind of stuff investing into something like that mm -hmm. very very predictable revenue yeah and that's that's something that I've seen over and over and over again where um, you know people will be sitting there making 20 or 25 percent a year going, why else would I want to do anything else? And mm -hmm. I agree with them. Yeah. I mean, it's like, it's a very, you know, it's not something that we do. It's just something that I've observed and noticed.